धमाधा कुंज बिहारी जय राधा माधवा कुंज बिहारी गोपी जन बल्लभ गिरिवर गोपीजन बल्लभ गिरिवर धारशोदानंदन व्रजजन रंजन जाशोदानंदन प्रजन रंजन जमुना तीर बनचा जमुना तीर बनचा जय राधा माधवा कुंज जय राधा माधवा कुंज हरि कृष्ण हरि कृष्ण 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 हरि 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 राम हरि राम 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 हरि हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे
जय जय प्रभु जय ओम विष्णुपाद परमहंस परिव्रज कचार्य अष्टोत्तर शतुषी श्रीमद अभय चरणारविंद भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी प्रभुपाद की जाय अनंत कोटि वैष्णव वृंद की जाय नामाचार्य शिल हरिदास ठाकुर की जाय प्रेम से कहु श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु नित्यानंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधार शिवाशाली गौर भक्त वृंद की जाय श्री श्री राधा कृष्ण गोप गोपीनाथ श्याम कुंड राधा कुंड गिरि गोवर्धन की जाय श्री वृंदावन धाम की जाय श्री मथुरा धाम की जाय श्री जगन्नाथपुरी धाम की जाय श्री मायापुर नवद्वीप धाम की जाय गंगा माई की जाय जमुना माई की जाय भक्ति देवी की जाय तुलसी महारानी की जाय हरि नाम संकीर्तन की जाय समवेत भक्त वृंद की जाय गौर प्रेमानंदे हरि हरि गौ ऑल ग्लोरीज टू द एसेंबल डिवोटीज ऑल ग्लोरीज टू द एसेंबल डिवोटीज ऑल ग्लोरीज टू द एसेंबल डिवोटीज ऑल ग्लोरीज टू श्री गुरु एंड श्री गौरांगो ऑल ग्लोरीज टू श्री प्रभा नम ओं विष्णुपदाय कृष्ण पृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी नीति नामिने नमस्ते सरस्वती देव गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात ओं नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओं नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय नारायण नमस्कृत नर चरोत्तम देवी सरस्वती व्यास तथो जय मुदीर नष्ट प्रायशु अभद्रेशु नित भागवत सेवया भगवती उत्तम श्लोके भक्तिर्भवती नैष्टिकी हरे कृष्ण I can see that many of you have come here today. How many of you have come here today? Okay. <laughs> so uh Yesterday we started the seminar. Is the sound all right? Yesterday we started the seminar. on uddhav gita uddhav gita has been described in the 11th canto of shrimad bhagavatam in first 10 cantos different um, aspects of puran has been described a uh, mahapuran has 10 symptoms leading to ashray or supreme shelter or ultimate benefit so that is uh, coming to krishna as the supreme personality of godhead krishna not an incarnation but krishna as the source of all incarnations and after that description after going to this complete descriptions of a puran krishna now is advising uddhav on the essential teachings of shrimad bhagavatam and that is uddhav gita uddhav gita is from 
20 I'm sorry 7th chapter to 29th chapter these 23 chapters are describing Uddhav Gita in the 11th canto and in that 11th canto Krishna is very emphatically pointing out that the ultimate goal is pure devotion to Krishna gradually step by step uh, he is describing that and he starts off the description with hmm, the anecdote of an Abhuduta whom Yadu, King Yadu, Krishna's ancestor, met. Uh, and this Abhuduta or a Paramhamsa devotee of the Lord described about 24 that how he learned different spiritual instructions from 24 different gurus. There are various less spiritual lessons he learned from different personalities, different living entities and also different phenomena, different elements. So after describing that he pointed out that the f goal of fruitive activities is to offer those activities to Krishna. Fruitive activities means acting for the sake of uh, enjoying the results of the action. Generally people act in order to enjoy the results of those actions. But Krishna pointed out in the 10th chapter that the enjoying the results of action uh, even though they are performed or executed according to the instructions of the Vedas is ultimately useless. But one must develop uh, pure devotion to Krishna because that is the ultimate goal. Then the purpose of renunciation and sannas uh, also uh, should be to ultimately become a pure devotee of Krishna. So in this way time and time again through different chapters Krishna is pointing out that the ultimate goal of life or ultimate goal of any spiritual activity is to develop pure love for Krishna. That is the goal of life. And besides that, there is no other objective. The purpose of our existence uh, in the material nature uh, or the, the reasons for our material bondage is our rejection of Krishna. And as a result of that, everybody is suffering. So how can we get out of this condition, imprisonment? Uh, simply by developing our loving relationship with Krishna. So that is the ultimate goal of life. So <clears throat> Now we are coming to the 12th chapter of Uddhav Gita, or rather 12th chapter of 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. This chapter has been entitled as Beyond Renunciation and Knowledge. Renunciation uh, is uh, sannas. Renouncing. Yes, uh, renunciation is essential, renunciation is beneficial. Uh, but what is beyond renunciation? What is that sound? Maybe we can switch off the fan. There is no need for the fan.
So, <clears throat> this ultimate goal of life one can understand only due to the association of a pure devotee of the Lord. Without the association, without the mercy of a pure devotee of the Lord, it is not possible to receive the informations about the spiritual sky. It's a very, uh, it's a very simple to understand that. That, that is beyond our sense perception. How can we know about that? Things that we do not, we cannot see. Things that, about that we do not have any access through our senses. How can we get to know about that? Unless and until somebody who has the information about that world comes and tells us. For example, at the beginning, even Brahma did not have this knowledge. Although Brahma came directly from the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Brahma did not have this knowledge. Brahma was in ignorance. That actually indicates that in the material nature, everybody is born in ignorance. Uh, Janmana Jayati Shudra. Shudra means a person who is in ignorance. So in, by birth, everyone is in ignorance. Even Brahma was in ignorance. And, but Brahma was inquisitive to know. Like, what should I do? Who am I? What am I doing here? Where did I come from? And that such led Brahma to receive the mercy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And as a result of that, finally Brahma received uh, the instructions from the Lord. And that instruction from the Supreme Personality of Godhead came from within. Uh, another thing that this knowledge cannot be acquired externally. This knowledge comes from within. Therefore, this, is, this knowledge is known as revealed knowledge. Revealed. It's a matter of revelation. It's revealed. This knowledge we cannot acquire by our intellectual uh, endeavor. Hmm. This knowledge can be received only by the mercy of a Vaishnava who comes as a bona fide spiritual master. So we see that Brahma received the knowledge from within his heart. That is how this knowledge came to this world. And also yesterday we were discussing like this knowledge was not available in the Western world. This knowledge uh, was limited only within India. But then Srila Prabhupada came and they, then this knowledge has become accessible, available in the West. Had Prabhupada not have come, we wouldn't have been sitting here discussing about Uddhava Gita. Huh? <laughs> so this is how this knowledge spreads individually and collectively. So time and time again this point also has been established. Only by the association of a saintly personality this knowledge is available. That's the only means, that's the only way. Without the mercy of a devotee it's impossible to receive this knowledge. The books are there containing this knowledge but still this knowledge will not be available. Like we notice uh, before Prabhupada came to the West, Bhagavad Gita was available. Many people read Bhagavad Gita, even uh, Jefferson, Thoreau, uh, these great philosophers, they were exposed to Bhagavad Gita. Uh, but what did they understand? Uh, they appreciated Bhagavad Gita from their intellectual point of view, but the essence of Bhagavad Gita was not available to them. Meaning, 
Bhagavad Gita was available, but devotional service to Krishna was not available. Uh, only after Srila Prabhupada came, then uh, devotion to Krishna became available. So many people became devotees, so many people are becoming devotees all over the world just by the mercy of one personality. So this is how this knowledge actually spreads, by the mercy of a, a saintly personality which means a pure devotee of the Lord. Now in this chapter the glories of the association of the devotee is being described in the 12th chapter. What does the association of a pure devotee do? It destroys the soul's attachment to the material life. An individual in the material, every body in this material nature is attached to the material enjoyment, sense gratification. Everybody. Starting from an insect up to the most exalted personality. They all, are in, they all think that the goal of life is to enjoy. From the childhood one is directed, go to school, study nicely. Then go to college, become qualified uh, so that you can enjoy. <laughs> but when you come across a pure devotee of the Lord, then what he says? <laughs> That's all useless. <laughs> Give it up. And, <clears throat> and the association of a pure devotee, saintly devotees, destroy uh, the soul's attachment to material life. And mm, he becomes uh, attracted to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So this is the uh, important consideration. We can give up something when you get something better. Ah. Say for example, in, in your hand, you have, a, you have some silver. But then when you get some gold, then what do you do? Do you hold on to the silver? You drop the silver, get the gold. But then there is a handful of diamond. What do you do? <laughs> Drop the gold, take the diamond. <laughs> so similarly, when we get something higher, we spontaneously give up that is lower in order to have that is higher. So that is what we actually learn from a devotee. Like, Devotee, uh, like yesterday that point came up, that it is said that devotee should not enjoy. Uh, it is, uh, in, one should not try to enjoy. No. Uh, one should try not, one should not, one should try to give up the false enjoyment. Wrong enjoyment, what goes on in the name of enjoyment but actually suffering. One should give that up uh, for the sake of real enjoyment. Mm. And it is not a matter of scholarship, it's a matter of common sense. <laughs> so that's why it is time pointed out time and time again, to become a devotee of Krishna, one doesn't have to become a big scholar. Uh, one has to have simple common sense. <laughs> Unfortunately, big scholars don't have that. <laughs> And that's why they can't accept it. That, uh, that is the unfortunate state of affair. <clears throat> and then it has been pointed out, Krishna pointed out to Uddhav, that Uddhav, nothing in this world, no other, even, no other endeavor, even spiritual endeavor, can give us pure devotion. Mm. He's saying, Sankhya, Yoga, mm. Religious activities, study of scriptures, <coughs> austerities, renunciation, uh, 
work of Ishta and Purtam, these are also uh, purificatory and uh, pious activities. Vows of fasting, worship of the demigods, uh, secret mantras, visiting, to holy, visiting of holy places, nor the adherence of any major or minor regulative principle can offer the same result. Uh, what we can get <clears throat> from the association of a pure devotee of the Lord cannot be achieved by any of these endeavors, uh, if, which actually means a perfection of uh, jnana, sankha philosophy, perfection of yoga. Uh, one may achieve the perfection of yoga, uh, still he won't get that. That will be discussed in the next chapter, I mean, in one of the later chapters, I'll come to that. Uh, so all these activities are considered to be pious activities prescribed in the Vedas, mm, but even those activities cannot give that spiritual benefit that one derives simply from the association of a devotee. Mm. On the other hand, by the association of devotees, uh, what to speak of saintly personalities, pious individuals, even the demons can become devotees. <coughs> demons can become uh, devotees of the Lord. Many de demons have become devotees. Mm. Although born in a demoniac family, to begin with, Prahlad Maharaj, uh, Bali Maharaj, uh, Brithrasura, uh, Vanasura, Bibhishan, they are born in demoniac families, but they have become pure devotees of the Lord. <coughs> what to speak of living in uh, human beings or demigods or demons? Even birds can become devotees. Uh, snakes can become devotees. Uh, like birds. Uh, Garuda, a bird, an eternal associate of the Lord. Jatayu was a bird. Uh, but uh, because of his association with King Dashara, uh, he became a devotee. And he gave his life for the sake of uh, protecting Sita Devi. Gave his life. Ravana killed him, but he fought with Ravana. Ravan was such a terrible demon, but this bird fought with Ravan, broke his chariot. He, Ravan had a tough time fighting with him. So these are the wonderful characteristics. Kaliya became a devotee, a snake. Although initially he had such a, the Kaliya had such a uh, uh, inimical attitude. Uh, snakes are generally uh, envious. Uh, violent, aggressive, cruel. But uh, this serpent became a devotee. There are other instances in Puran uh, that uh, somebody became, I mean, snakes became a devotee. Once a snake uh, became, uh, snake came across Narad Muni and asked Narad Muni, can you please give me some good advice? So Narad Muni said, don't bite. And <clears throat> so the snake took the advice and snake started stop biting. So after some time Narad Muni came and found that the snake was in a pathetic state. He asked what happened? He said, well, people beat me up. They throw stones at me. <laughs> and that, now that I have become non-violent. <laughs> so Narad Muni, so why is that? He said, because I don't bite, people are not afraid of me anymore. <laughs> so they are just beating me and doing all kinds of, torturing me in various ways. So Narad Muni said, I told you not to bite, but I didn't tell you not to show your hood. <laughs> so here is another instance when a snake became a devotee. We know the hunter, Brigari became a, Devotee. Ah. 
So, uh, this is how it becomes uh, obvious how powerful the association of a pure devotee is. Mm. This is the potency, this is the power of the association of a pure devotee. Like, they are, although huh, they may not, they may be illiterate, they may be in a very, very degraded state of existence, they may be completely in the mode of, uh, uh, different modes of material nature, but a pure devotional service can elevate them, or the association of a pure devotee can elevate them to the platform of pure devotion. And that's why we yesterday we discussed about the touchstone. What is the characteristic of a touchstone? In the material nature, there are touchstones. But what that touchstone do? Uh, it turns base metal into gold. Uh, base met turns base metal into gold. But what does the spiritual touchstone do? It turns any other object into a touchstone. So that is the quality of a pure devotee. It converts a pure devotee, uh, any other living entity, into a pure devotee. <clears throat> and then finally he is pointing out the, about the, the damsels of Braja. The damsels of Vrindavan, the gopis, they were not very learned. Uh, they were not uh, so much concerned about uh, the uh, studies of Vedas and practicing the uh, Vedic rituals and so forth. They were simple village girls. Uh, they were cowherd girls, not even Brahmana girls. Or even some Brahmanas also, anyway, I'll come to that later. Uh, like the wives of the Brahmanas. Uh, they became devotees of Krishna. But Krishna is specifically speaking about the, the cowherd damsels. Mm, the, the damsels of Vrindavan. Haribol, uh, either listen to the class or just, uh, or go at the back. Okay. <clears throat> So, uh, the best devotees are the damsels of Vrindavan. That's what Krishna is pointing out. Why? Because the way they surrendered themselves to Krishna, they offered themselves to Krishna, uh, that is the greatest kind of uh, offering. Like, they offered themselves to Krishna without any reservations. They did not have any other consideration. For the sake of Krishna, they were prepared to ev give up everything. Like they uh, didn't care about their family, they didn't care about uh, uh, their reputation. In the Vedic society, a reputation for a woman is very, very important. Uh, it is considered the greatest jewel of a woman that she wears is her reputation, her chastity. But these uh, young girls of Vrindavan, they didn't care for any, their reputation. They, uh, their activity was apparently immoral. They rejected, they gave up their husbands, they gave up their children. They didn't have any consideration for anybody. Uh, it has been described like uh, the mother was uh, ta taking care of the child. As soon as they heard, as soon as she heard Krishna's flute, she dropped her baby and ran. <laughs> Somebody was taking care of her husband. Huh? <laughs> But that is the highest devotion. Uh, and we can see also, apparently it seems, oh, it's such a, hmm, it's not right. Sometimes the moralists bring up that point. Why Krishna behave like that? Uh, but in that respect, 
our Acharya has made a very simple point uh, that if somebody's wife becomes a devotee of Krishna does the husband mind that? Uh, like there, I mean, if, if provided the husband is in right consciousness <laughs> like there are so many uh, ladies uh, in our society we see like they are married women they have become attracted to Krishna. Is there anything wrong? Rather, they are glorified that they have become attracted to Krishna. Mm. And even the husbands feel proud about it. Oh, you know, my wife is a devotee of Hare Krishna. <laughs> so, so <clears throat> and we make it a point also. When the husband becomes a devotee, one of the questions that we ask is, is your wife <laughs> supporting you <laughs> and we, we make it a point that uh, make her also a devotee if she is not a devotee if the wife is a devotee we ask her make your husband into a devotee uh, so that is the ultimate goal of life <clears throat> so uh, the, then Krishna pointed out the greatness of the gopi's devotion when the gopis were with Krishna, one night appeared to be like a moment to them. Their attachment to Krishna was so intense, their love for Krishna was so intense, that when they were with Krishna, they forgot everything. Even they forgot about time. Uh, their, a, a, a night appeared to be like a moment to them. And when they became separated from Krishna, then a moment appeared to be like uh, a millennium according to the calculation of a demigod. Nimeshena Jugaitam Chakshusha Prabrishaitam. So this is how intense was their love for Krishna. When they were with Krishna, they were in the height of ecstasy. When they were separated from Krishna, when Krishna uh, left Vrindavan, of course, uh, that's another point, Krishna never left Vrindavan. <laughs> it simply appeared that Krishna left Vrindavan. Vrindavanam paritajya kutra kadapi nagachati. Jiva Goswami pointed out. Krishna never takes a step out of Vrindavan. Krishna is always in Vrindavan. Anyway, but it seemed that when they felt that Krishna has left Vrindavan, then uh, they were plunged into an ocean of agony. So much so that they stopped eating. When Uddhava went to Vrindavan uh, to see, uh, to meet the, to carry, carrying the message of Krishna, then uh, he found that in the fireplace where they cook, there were cobwebs. Because they haven't been used for so long. Uh, I don't know whether you get cobwebs here. Do you get cobwebs here? Uh, also, okay. In India it's a pretty common thing. <laughs> if something is not used for some time, uh, the rooms or something, you get cobwebs. So, <clears throat> so uh, that means they didn't eat. They didn't cook food due to the separation from Krishna. Uh, the consideration was how they were still alive. They stopped eating. And uh, this also has been pointed out in Brihad Bhagavatam Ritam. That question came up. How are they still alive then? Although they didn't, they stopped eating. Then Balaram actually made that point. Because they are constantly remembering you. They are constantly chanting your holy name. That is what is keeping their life. Uh, in their body just by the chanting of the holy name the supreme lord Sri Krishna after imparting this knowledge this instruction to Uddhav advised that for the sake of attaining the absolute truth Uddhav should give up all considerations of religion and irreligion 
as promulgated, as promulgated in the Strutis and Smritis and instead take shelter of the examples of the women of Vrindavan. There is no need to follow any scriptures or uh, follow any uh, instructions that have been given in the Vedas, Shrutis and Smritis. What, is, what should be the ultimate goal of life? To follow the examples of the residents of Vrindavan. <clears throat> so now we go to the uh, chapter 13. This actually is describing about this chapter is describing about Hamsavatar. <coughs> Brahma had uh, four Manasaputras, four sons that appeared from his mind. Uh, who are the first four sons of Brahma? The four Kumaras. So the four Kumaras approached Brahma mm, about mm, the ultimate goal of life. And uh, then Brahma admitted that he actually does not have he is not in a position to instruct about that. And it has been explained huh, why that is because Brahma got so much involved in management <laughs> that he became, huh, he, he was quite doubtful whether he would be able to because his consciousness was affected by huh, the mode of passion, whether he would be able to give the right advice. Therefore, Brahma admitted that maybe hmm, we should approach the Supreme Personality of God. So this is another uh, thing about uh, a devotee of the Lord. He's honest. Uh, when he feels that he's not in a position to give instruction, he admits it and says, okay, hmm, this is the situation, so let me go to a higher authority to ask about that. And so when they approached the Lord, then the Lord appeared as Hamsa. Hamsa. Hamsa means a swan. So this is the Hamsa avatar that the Lord appeared in Satya Yuga. And he instructed that the human beings, <clears throat> overwhelmed by sense gratification, become bound by the three modes of material nature. What is the condition of a human being? A human being naturally becomes attracted to sense gratification. And this desire for sense gratification is simply for, simply due to the influence of the modes of material nature. Therefore, the material nature is becomes entangling. The spirit soul, as soon as he comes into the material nature, he becomes entangled. And what is that entanglement? Okay, maybe we can discuss this point a uh, little elaborately. How does a living entity become entangled in the material nature? A living entity, as soon as it turns his face away from Krishna, Krishna bohir mukhoya bhogobancha kore, bhogobancha kore, desires to enjoy. As soon as the living entity turns his face away from Krishna, he develops his desire for enjoyment. So, uh, how does it happen? 
a consciousness of a living entity is very minute. So it can be projected only onto one point or one direction. Hmm. So when a living entity's consciousness is projected towards Krishna, uh, when a living entity is looking towards Krishna, then he is spiritually situated. He is in the spiritual sky. Uh, but the moment a living entity turns his face away from Krishna, somehow or other, this point we cannot say why or how. Sometimes people ask question, that if the living entities were with Krishna, then how did they leave the association of Krishna and come to this material nature? And the thing is, somehow or other, uh, and Prabhupada said, uh, actually this is, uh, yeah, this is a very important point. Uh, Prabhupada actually mentioned that the cause of our fall down will never be able to uh, f figure out from the material point of view. Being in the material nature will never be able to find out why we fell down. Because the cause of our fall down lies in the spiritual nature. Therefore, unless and until we go back to the spiritual nature, we won't be able to find out why we fell down. Uh -huh. But at least theoretically, it has been pointed out this way. Somehow or other, living entity looks away from Krishna. Now, what is away from Krishna? Away from Krishna is Krishna's external energy. What is the nature of Krishna's external energy? Inferior. Hmm. But a jiva is superior. Although minute, a jiva is superior. Now when a superior comes across an inferior, what happens? Hmm. A junior devotee comes to a senior devotee. <laughs> and senior devotee says, do this, do that. <laughs> right? <laughs> Somebody <laughs> once, long time ago, told, in ISKCON, I can f figure out very easily who is the newest arrival. <laughs> because huh, it goes down the chain of discipline succession. <laughs> a senior one tells a junior one to do something. That one tells somebody else who is junior to him to do something. And finally, the one who does it uh, he is the newest arrival in the movement. <laughs> the junior most <laughs> devotee. <laughs> so, <clears throat> it is a natural tendency of a superior to dominate over the inferior. Mm. So, material nature is inferior. A living entity is coming from Krishna's superior energy. So he naturally develops a desire to lord over. Now is a living entity lord and master? A living entity's actual identity is that he is a servant. Huh? His, his constitution is that of a servant. But now he is assuming the role of a uh, lord and master. So is that real? No. That's why he gets a covering of false ego. False ego. Wrong identity. Ah. Unreal identity. Hmm. That is how a living entity, as soon as he comes in contact with material nature, ah. Material nature just grabs him. Nikotastha maya tare japotiya dhare. Very tightly grabs him. Uh, and <clears throat> he gets the covering of false ego. His identity changes. From the servant, now he became a master. Then he begins to plan how he is going to enjoy this material nature. He gets the second covering of intelligence and then his consciousness begins to flow towards the material direction 
through the mind. In this way, uh, with false ego, intelligence and mind, he gets entangled or entrapped and develops a subtle body comprising of these three subtle elements. And then according to the shape of his subtle body or condition of his subtle body, material nature awards him a gross body. Gross body is not our, our to uh, develop. Gross body is a gift of material nature according to our subtle body. And in this way a living entity becomes entangled in this material nature. So living entity uh, gets in, in, entangled in the material nature but what happens when he gets entangled in the material nature? What is the result of his false ego, false identity? Uh, the result of his false identity is acting in a wrong way. And wrong action leads him to suffering. As a result of that, living entity constantly suffers in the material nature. Mm. The living entity, over, overwhelmed by sense gratification, becomes bound by the three modes of nature. Huh? And <clears throat> therefore, he should become free from the entanglement of the material nature. So how to do that? Uh, with the mode of goodness, we can overcome the influence of passion and ignorance. Uh, but eventually, we have to give up the mode of goodness also. And that is possible only through devotional service. Mode of goodness is not the goal. Mode of goodness is utilized, used, simply to get rid of the influence of the passion and ignorance. But eventually we have to give up the mode of goodness also. And then one becomes situated in the transcendental mode, pure goodness, which is the spiritual state. And there Krishna is making one very important point. This point often comes up. That is the soul affected by the mode of goodness? I mean, is the soul affected by the three modes of material nature? The answer is no. Uh, Krishna is saying, uh, the <clears throat> three modes, goodness, passion and ignorance, are related to material intelligence, not to the soul. One should conquer the lower modes of passion and ignorance by the mode of goodness. And then, one must surpass the mode of goodness by acting in the transcendental mode of pure goodness. Now what is acting in the pure goodness? Uh, devotional service, pure devotional service. By associating with the things in the mode of goodness, one becomes more fully situated in that mode. The three modes hmm, increase their different influences through various types of scriptures, etc. And due to one's conditioning, one identifies with the material body uh, and consequently with the mode of passion. Uh, passion, influence of mode of passion is to identify with the body and become active in the material nature. It's describing how it happens. Then this uh, passion produces misery. Uh, passion produces misery. Uh, mode of goodness produces happiness. Mode of passion produces misery. And mode of ignorance uh, produces bewilderment. Uh, so, <clears throat> okay, uh, so anyway, this is how Krishna uh, instructed uh, as Hamsavatar. 
and here this point has been made uh, even Brahma is suffering agitation of the mind on account of the duties he has to perform as I said uh, Brahma is a big manager <laughs> and due to his involvement in his managerial duties <laughs> he is he is his mind is agitated therefore when he was questioned by his sons uh, who are born from his mind about the means for driving our desires of sense gratification he was he admitted that he was incapable of giving them an answer or properly guide them uh, and in order to receive some insight into this matter he took shelter of the Supreme Personality of God. And then the Lord appeared as Hamsa, Lord Hamsa proceeded to give instruction about the categorical identity of the self, the different states of consciousness. Uh, different states of consciousness are uh, wakeful state, sleep state, and uh, deep sleep state. These are also pertaining to uh, our material body. When we are in the gross bodily platform, that state is called wakeful state. Mm. When both the gross body and subtle body are active, that is the wakeful state. When the gross body is inactive, but the subtle body is active, that is the dream state. We dream. What is the dream? Dream is to go into the plane of the subtle body, act in the plane of subtle body. The gross body fell asleep. Gross body is unconscious, inner. Uh, but the subtle body is still active. That state is the state of hmm, dream state but when both gross and subtle bodies are inactive that is the state of deep sleep uh, that is the state of deep sleep <coughs> wakeful state is a state of generally state that is influenced by the passion dream state also is influenced by passion but deep sleep is in ignorance. Uh, so when we are in ignorance, uh, then we are in deep sleep. But to transcend that, uh, we have to uh, go beyond the bodily platform. Both gross and subtle bodies uh, and the means of conquering of a material existence, the sages headed by Shanaka became freed from all their doubts by hearing the words of the Lord and worshipped him with pure devotion in mature love of God. So we still have about 25 minutes. Should we go to the next chapter or should I ask questions? Huh? How many want me? How many of you want to ask questions? Uh, okay. How many? Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Very good. Okay. So let's go into questions because, uh, as I said, like question answers is the best way to cultivate knowledge. So, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yeah. discussed this last stage, the stages of consciousness, as to the wakeful stage and the dream stage and the, so what happens, uh, like, uh, I, I just, uh, I had heard about the Shushukti stage, which is the deep sleep stage, uh, so in forms of ignorance and uh, knowledge, how, how does it contribute to our, uh, you know, getting the knowledge uh, at these stages, uh, basically? Mm. Well, uh, uh, okay, the question is that uh, concerning this last point, wakeful uh, dream and deep sleep state, 
like when we go into the deep sleep, uh, how does it contribute to knowledge? Uh, ignorance doesn't actually contribute much to knowledge. <laughs> deep sleep is, but ultimately, but at the same time we need it. You know why we need it? Because a living entity, due to the mode of passion, gets involved in the material, materialistic activities. Uh, and these materialistic activities are very painful, very troublesome. Uh, therefore, uh, he needs to give up. Let us consider it this way. What we are doing in the mode of passion? Carrying this lump of this body. A big, heavy burden we are carrying. Right? And then we become tired. And we say, to hell with it. <laughs> and that's the time we go to sleep. We need it. Without sleep, we cannot continue. Right? So that is what the sleep, deep sleep is contributing. But it is actually, uh, in a way, it is taking us close to Krishna. Because we have given up our material consciousness, therefore we are somehow close to Krishna, but without awareness. That's why it's in ignorance. But when that closeness to Krishna happens with knowledge, that is the real solution to our material bondage. Uh, like it is, otherwise, it is temper is happening, like passion to ignorance, passion to ignorance, like that. Like in mode of passion, we become active throughout the day and then uh, at night we fall asleep, enter into ignorance. Then again in the morning, we come back into mode of passion and then again enter into ignorance at night, uh, falling asleep. But with mode of goodness, we have to come out of that cycle of ignorance, passion, ignorance, passion. Right? And then we have to transcend even the mode of goodness. Uh, because mode of goodness runs the risk of falling back into passion again. Like Prabhupada gives the example. Uh, they go to these uh, yogis and all these people. Uh, they go to the Himalayas. Stay there for so long. Uh, but then they come back uh, to do some philanthropic work. Right? Because they can't stay in that state for too long. Uh, they come back to do some philanthropic work or nowadays they come back to America to make money. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> but the thing is, the sustainable condition will be only when one is situated in pure goodness, completely out. Because mode of goodness is also tinged with passion and ignorance. Material mode of goodness, it's not pure goodness. It's tinged hmm, with passion and ignorance. But pure goodness is only in spiritual platform. Uh, you have a question at the back? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I had a question about you said uh, uh, in order to create something, you have to be passionate. You need passion, and the, the characteristic for goodness is uh, being happy. Uh, so sometimes in our work we are given some project to execute or in research you are under the pressure to do something new, to create something new. So uh, my experience is that sometimes passion helps, helps in that case because sometimes if you are, I, in my case if I am in the mood of goodness then I think, I think of myself being more complacent about my, or maybe it is not the right way but... Yeah, very good point, very good point. Like, <clears throat> like, in order to do things or achieve things, we have to function in the mode of passion. We have to utilize mode of passion, otherwise we won't be able to do it. That's true, that's very true. Like, as you we were saying, the activity in the material platform is, in, is uh, executed through the mode of pa passion, right? Without that, without mode of passion, we cannot actually function. Uh, but
But the point is, the generally, mode of passion will lead to suffering. Goodness leads to enjoyment, happiness, not enjoyment, happiness. Passion leads to misery. But when that passion is utilized for the sake of Krishna consciousness, huh? so, uh, <clears throat> but when this passion is utilized in the mode, in, for Krishna consciousness, then that becomes the cause of freedom from bondage. Huh? Like an, uh, an example uh, can be given, Arjun is fighting the battle. You can't, Prabhupada is saying that you can't fight a battle unless you are, unless you are extremely angry. You can't kill people unless you are angry, which is in the mode of passion. But this passion of Arjun is not for his own sense gratification. This passion of Arjun is ex utilized for the sake of serving Krishna. Huh? So, huh? in Krishna consciousness, the, hmm, when these modes are utilized, then they become the cause of freedom from the bondage, executing devotional service. So yes, huh? passion is necessary. Uh, in order to uh, do something, but it must be, we must be careful that it is done with proper uh, purpose, with the ultimate objective. Krishna consciousness. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Yes? Spiritual knowledge? Good point, yeah. The point is that <clears throat> uh, you said that the spiritual knowledge is revealed uh, from within, uh, but at the same time Prabhupada is saying that we must use our intelligence and intellect for studying books. The studying books is the platform of sadhana bhakti. Uh, we are practicing devotional service. But ultimately, uh, the perfection will come as a revelation from within. Like Divya Gyan, Ride Prakashita. Mm. The transcendental knowledge is revealed within the heart. Uh, so we are practicing devotional service, sadhana bhakti, to achieve prema bhakti. But that, and that prema, love for Krishna, will develop from within. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, Krishna will manifest from within. He is there. So any other, yes? Well, it depends, you know, like just as any other thing. Uh, if it is spiritual, then it is beneficial. If it is material, uh, like uh, say if you, are, if you are dreaming that you are rendering devotional service to Krishna, that is very good. But if you are dreaming that you have become a queen, <laughs> <laughs> and enjoying with the king, <laughs> then it is. So, ultimate consideration is whether it's material or spiritual, whether it's for my sense gratification or whether it is for develop for rendering service to Krishna. That is the ultimate criteria. Yes. The living, living entities are by nature. And the law of nature, they are materialistic. So when you argue on that point, if you, we are going towards the spiritual part of the living 
materialistic art, how can you make it consistent with the law of nature that you are part of the nature at the same time? Yeah, okay, good point. Yeah, there you have to now understand there are two natures, right? Material nature and spiritual nature. Right? You are saying living entities by na material, by nature, they are like this. They are like that due to the influence of the material nature. Right? Living entity wants to enjoy, living entity wants to do certain things. But the living entity is not material. Your body is material. You, the soul, is spiritual. Now the consideration is whether you want to remain in your bodily platform or whether you want to come to a spiritual platform. When you come to the spiritual platform, then you come under the spiritual nature. Then the material nature's influence become automatically uh, diminished. You got the point? <laughs> okay. You are, uh, where are you from? Okay, you can. You are, you are uh, familiar with Prabhupada's books? Yeah, you are reading? Yeah, yeah. So read Prabhupada's books, it will become clear. That there are two natures, you know. Like we have two identities, right? We have a physical identity and we have a spiritual identity. Like the body is matter. But the soul? Soul is not matter. Soul is spiritual. Now the consideration is, should we be on the bodily platform? Or should we try to become elevated to our spiritual identity, the soul? And there is a process by which you can become situated on your spiritual identity. And when you cultivate that, then you overcome the influence of material nature uh, and come to your spiritual state of existence. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs> yes, Krishna Ji. You mentioned that the, um, the pure devotee can be likened to touchstone. Hmm. Whatever touchstone touches also becomes gold. Hmm. So base metal will become gold. So it's indiscriminate. Yet the pure devotee, for many people can come in contact with the pure devotee and then they don't become pure themselves. Some may, but some may not. So how do we recommend Yeah, good. You see, uh, here, the consideration is that living entity is a conscious being with his independence. So a living entity can decide whether he will accept it or not. He has the opportunity to become a touchstone. The consideration is whether he is going to take advantage of that opportunity. That is up to him. Hmm. So that is the only difference. A stone is dev devoid of independence. So some touchstone touches and becomes stone. Touchstone. Right? But we are not stones. We are. <laughs> we are conscious living entities. With our, with our consciousness, with our ability to discriminate, with our ability to decide. Huh? And when we utilize the facul these faculties properly, then yes, we can become. Yeah. Isn't that that proclivity to not become pure? Isn't that a contamination? So it's, can't the pure devotee cut through that? I mean, in one sense, it's not really us acting on our proper path. Right. And that is why the guru chastises. <laughs> <laughs> Whether you like it or not. <laughs> Yeah. So the point is <clears throat> that service is due to, as a, service is an expression of love. But sometimes we find that service dries out our love. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, I, sorry, what I meant to say was 
Okay, good. Huh? Yeah. So uh, we are not rendering the service with love, huh? or uh, devoid of love. So you see, there are two stages of devotion. One is devotional service in practice. Like when you are practicing, then you have to make an endeavor. That endeavor may not be very pleasing. Hmm. But when you achieve perfection, then it becomes natural. Like an example can be given, like you know how to ride a bicycle. When, did you just jump into a bicycle and started to ride it? What happened? How did, how did you learn? You had, you had to practice. While you're practicing, did you fall? Did you get hurt? But still you can continue to practice. And then one fine morning you find yourself all of a sudden you're balancing on the cycle and you're riding on your own. Right? Then it became easy and natural. So practicing stage is difficult. Hmm. But, through, but practice is necessary to achieve the perfection. But when you achieve the perfection, uh, then uh, it becomes spontaneous. Sa same thing with devotional service. Or same thing with love. Right? Uh, like, here the po consideration is, uh, here we have to love somebody whom we cannot see. Whom we cannot touch. Uh, that is the problem. Right? Therefore, we have to cultivate the process so that we can see him. And we can perceive him. But in order to do that, we have to practice. But once we perfect, once we achieve perfection through the practice, then it becomes natural. Uh, because then we find that he is the ultimate object of our love. We love something that is beautiful. He is the most beautiful. We love something that's powerful. He is the most powerful. In this way, he is endowed with all the qualities that attract us. Therefore, love for him is spontaneous. But in order to, we have to develop that love. And the way to develop that love is through hearing. That's the only faculty that we can conceive him with. Only through hearing we can see him. Only through hearing we can perceive him. Therefore hearing is the only process. But then it works. And and then we fall in love with him. Then the service becomes spontaneous. Out of love. All right. Thank you. Yes, Nanda Dulal. Uh, Guru Mahadev, you mentioned that, you know, I just want to ask the question uh, the other way. We don't believe in Darwin's theory that you know, we came from the lowest species of life. But we do believe in that way that, you know, soul transmigrates to different bodies. And when you fell down, who decides that? Because we are in Krishna at that time. Although we have looked down and away from him, but what species we come from? We come from the human being? Or we start from the different which you know, species we come The Prabhupada said that when, you, when one falls down, the first position he goes through is Brahma. <laughs> like in a way we can understand, we are coming from spiritual sky. We are coming from there. In the material, what will be the first position that will touch? And then this way. <laughs> so, <laughs> now how did it happen? Uh, but at least, you know, we have to accept uh, the words of our Guru, Srila uh, Prabhupada.
Okay, any other question? Good. Oh yeah, Aditya Narayan. <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, when you're talking of like how we have to develop the feeling of love, I'm thinking like when we chant our Java, we are normally like, uh, we just try to hear the but, uh, but should that also be a mode of chanting with feeling? Yeah. And how do yeah. we develop that feeling? Because right now we are just like, okay, let's yeah. The thing is that we have to recognize that it's a prayer. Hare Krishna Mahamantra is actually a prayer. So with the prayerful mood we have to chant. We are offering prayers to Krishna. And the prayers are uh, mixed with or blended with uh, uh, our feelings. Like, Krishna, please deliver me from this miserable suffering condition. That is the first aspect of the prayer. Uh, Hare Krishna. I'm suffering in this material nature. Krishna, please deliver me from this suffering condition. And in this way, according to our internal state of consciousness, we will, uh, it will be, bla- be mixed with our feelings. Uh, prayers are not just uttering some words. Prayers are heartfelt. Yes. So our greed is justified to, you know, our the greed that we have, we want to get out of this, you know, materialistic life. Is yeah. That justified in the sense that you know the there is a saying that we have to get out the greed that we should not be uh, attached to get something for the yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it will come. To get, to get out of this materialistic world, right. we have to be greedy. Is that justified? Yeah, sure. Sure. Tatra lolam atra mullam ekalam. That's why you touched a very important point. Is the greed, that is the only thing uh, that you can pay the price with to get Krishna. Lolam. Lolam means greed. In the material nature, we are greeding for, we are greedy for objects of our sense gratification. Isn't it? We are greedy for things that will give us physical pleasure. But this greed should be diverted uh, towards receiving the mercy of Krishna. The greed should be there, but should be utilized for the right purpose. Uh Hare Krishna.